Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and today we're at the fabulous Fox Theater in St. Louis. It's a red letter day worth dressing up for. Uh, we're happy to finally be here to show you this instrument. Um, here at the fabulous Fox, this building has to be seen to be believed. If you've never been in here, it's an amazing job they've done reconstructing this 1929 movie palace. William Fox owned 1,100 theaters across the country, but it's really the last five that he's remembered for. These last five movie palaces were in St. Louis, Detroit, Brooklyn, San Francisco, and uh, in Atlanta. Out of all five of those, only three of them are still standing. Four of those had what we call the Fox Special Wurlitzer organ. This was a 36 rank instrument, the largest production instrument Wurlitzer ever made. Uh, they also put one in the New York Paramount. Of those five organs, there's only two of them left in their original locations, in Detroit and here in St. Louis, and from what I hear, the one in Detroit is not playing right now. We hope it'll be playing in uh, 2020, so uh, if you're interested in going to the uh, Theater Organ Society when that happens. We hear the organ's going to be back up. I certainly hope so. Here in St. Louis, the St. Louis Theater Organ Society and the technicians working for the Fox have done a great job of caring for this instrument and keeping it playing, and uh, we're happy to finally be able to bring it here to you. Now to uh, demonstrate the instrument for us and get us started, bring it up out of the pit, Dr. Stephen Ball. Stephen, thank you so much for coming here today and demonstrating this wonderful uh, Wurlitzer organ. Absolutely. It's amazing sound out there in the room to hear this thing. And what I realize is when you hear it, we're hearing 1929. That's what this room sounded like. It's the exact same sounds. Yeah. So uh, this is just a fascinating instrument. It's a little different than a church organ, right? Things are... 
not what we would normally expect. Right. You have sound colors that aren't available normally in a church organ, but the organization is actually very consistent with British church organ building in that time. That's Robert Hope Jones was uh, exactly. sort of the originator of this, and he was a British organ builder. Well, we don't have traditional divisions like great swell and choir like we would. We have chambers, and we have different, uh, different kinds of, of choruses. As I understand it. First of all, we have four manuals. What are the names of the manuals? All right. On the, well, you have pedal division, pedal first of all. Uh, accompaniment is the lowest keyboard, great division, okay. next, great. bombard, solo. So we don't have a swell or a choir. We, and bombard and solos do show up in classical organs. But right. um, again, we don't have the typical kind of choruses of 842 mixture sort exactly. of thing. Right, you build your choruses up in different ways on a theater organ, but you you know it's it's in, it's incorrect to really think of a theater organ as just tibias, which is you know a lot of people know the warbling, the famous flute, uh, or just uh, you know just foundations, because all of these stops for the most part are very highly unified, but they're unified in each place for purpose. They're, not every stop appears everywhere on this specification. Certain things appear only in the accompaniment, certain things appear only in the bombard, and that's because that's where they'd be most likely to be used. And there might be some stops that are on both or in different right. manuals, but not every single one. Well, let's start. First of all, it does have a, a principal sound, a diapason tone. Yes. Um, so Three, in fact. So they're all three, but they're all eight foot, mm -hmm. but they play at different uh, pitch ranges because of the unification. So you could actually sort of build, of course, right? Right. So if I kill the trims there, that'll get rid of some of the okay. noise. Uh, the smallest is the horn diapason. It's coming from over there behind us. Right. And then there's another larger diapason. And the largest, the diaphonic, is really where the diaphone comes from, the large wood diaphone. And everybody knows that wood diaphone because it goes down into 32s. So there are, there are, as you said, different chambers here. There's actually seven chambers in the organ, but only four of them are enclosed. Okay. So what we're really talking about here is a normal feeder organ, a main and a solo, uh, and then you have the sort of, uh, uh, you know, higher pressure neighbors, each one performing the same function. So on the main, its high pressure neighbor upstairs is the foundation, mm -hmm. and then the high pressure neighbor of the solo is the orchestral. So this is kind of a standard two manual, th or two manual theater organ that has just been expanded with more of the same. Right, bigger form. scale, bigger pressure, and uh, because of the pressures involved, you have a wider variety of color. So that diaphonic diapason is a, a 38 scale diapason as opposed to the much smaller scale horn diapason. Well, and that's, those were all diapason, but they all had very different qualities for being, they're all yes. kind of, I would say they're very English sounding, but still there's a lot of difference in just those three between the diaphone and the smallest one. Right, and if you took the middle diapason and you, you know, you played it at four foot as well, it sounds like a very passable 20s church organ diapason. And also this is 36 ranks of pipes. Uh, this room seats 4,000 people. Um, there's a 1,000 seat church across the street that has 72 ranks in it. <laughs> How do you get 36 ranks to fill a room like that? It'd normally be like 200 ranks is what you would need if this were a church. Lots of pressure. pressure. Uh, the, there are, the blower in the basement is 50 horse. Wow. And so that's, for 36 ranks, that's a pretty extraordinary that's, that's amount a lot of, of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and in fact, the blowers in this organ are redundant. There's two. A lot, of pe a lot of our viewers probably know this. There are only seven Fox organs with two blowers. And that's, you know, in a way that's kind of funny because the Spencer blowers are probably the most reliable part of, <laughs> of the whole machine. But the reason for the redundancy was just to make sure that the organ was always available for a show. You never had a single point failure. That makes sense. So um, from there, you mentioned the tibias now. That's sort of the next voice that's the one that's very theatrical and people assign it to the theater organ as being sort of the, the basic thing. But it's, it's, a, it's a useful stop. How, how many tibias do we have now? There's three tibias, three. same thing. So it's not a mistake. Three diapasons, three tibias. Each one is working in opposition to each other. Uh, and if you have the tibia without, without the tremulants, of course, it sounds like a big flute, which is really what it is. The, the, the tibia claws are really actually, tibia is a Latin word for flute. Okay. So if you turn the trims on, then you get the sound everybody thinks of as a theater organ sound.
And with all three of them together, you're getting a very stereophonic sound with, between the two different sides of the, of the chambers here. Absolutely. And part of the art of registering this organ is not putting stops on, it's knowing what to leave off. Mm. So in most registrations, you never want to have all the same pitches on. You actually want to take off the ones that are redundant that you don't need because it creates phasing. So let's, let's talk about that. There's three different tibias or three different sizes, uh, but they're all just labeled eight tibia. So you have to know where they are in the organ. And to that end, there's a little indicator above each one that's different. What do those indicate? Right. That's that's how we keep track of where the sounds come from. Okay. So if you look, you see that there's at least four different styles that mm -hmm. occur on the stop rail. The, the blank one is the main chamber, so no, right. none of the tibias are in the main. The little black dot is the solo chamber. The next largest, because they're all organized from left to right by mm -hmm. volume of okay. sound, the next is the uh, orchestral chamber. That's being the very loudest. The one with the black circle is the foundation that's the next largest mm -hmm. and the smallest is that solo chamber. So in addition to what, not just knowing where the stops are and what they are, you have to look at that extra little indication to know where in the <laughs> room they are. Uh, it's not like a, a typical organ where all the great stops are in the grate. All of those three tibias play on the grate, but they're coming from different chambers right. uh, and you can mix and match with the other chambers and other stops to, to get those colors. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> it is, and it also says something about why they're there. So it's true that the, of the, if you look at the most powerful chambers, the orchestral uh, and the solo chamber, uh, and the excuse me, the orchestral and the foundation are the most powerful chambers here. Paying attention to which ones of those stops occur on the grate versus the bombard gives you some clue as to how they're used. Mm -hmm. So you know, the accompaniment is an eight-foot manual primarily, grate and bombard are 16-foot manuals, and the solo is an eight-foot manual. So you can see just by the choice of that Wurlitzer mm -hmm. is made about what stops appear where, you have an idea of how the organ is going to be played. Nice. Well, we have some other flutes. Those are the tibias of stopped flute. We have some, some open flutes in here as well. Absolutely. In fact, the, the organization of all the colors here just tells you what type of pipes they are. So the mm -hmm. white, uh, white tabs are all flu okay. or whistle pipes. Mm -hmm. The red tabs are all reeds, with the exception of the yellow here. The yellow is celeste, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's one open flute which doesn't often get heard because it's far away in the foundation and, uh, and not the loudest stop in the organ, but it's the beautiful harmonic flute. It's a very yeah. delicate it's shift. Like, but it's got, it. it's got a little edge to it and it cuts through with that brightness even though it's not very loud. So um, I can imagine that's a very gentle little solo voice might show up every now and then. Works very well with the strings too. Okay. And of course, not a mistake, it occurs everywhere it occurs, which is the, mm -hmm. the bombard. There's a big the string chorus right with it. With oh, it. Very good. There's a concert flute. It would be found in every Wurlitzer organ. It's always located in the main chamber. There's a couple of other flutes that we didn't talk okay. about. There's a quintadina, um, which is fairly unusual in Wurlitzer. That's in the solo That's chamber. Very distinctive sounds. Back in the main chamber, we have a Lieblick flute. That's very similar to a concert flute, except it's just stoppered. And those are all very gentle. They mostly serve to color your accompanimental sounds, your exactly. background sort of sounds. Okay. And there's one others that would be within that category, but really it's more of a diapason technically, mm -hmm. and that's the dulciana. That's actually the softest stop in the whole organ. It is very soft, but you can still hear that in the back of the room, can't you? It, oh, yeah. it still manages to cut through and, and fill the space. These are all part of the, all those pianissimo stops. The magic of this organ is in that delicate accompaniment that it provides. Each one of those is a different part of the composition of the perfume of the accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Well, the next thing would be the strings. Okay. So you have whole families of tone here. Each, each chamber has strings in it. The smallest is the solutional. Now, as I said, there's only two Celestes in a, in a Fox special, so the Solutional has no Celeste. Next in size, we have the Ville d'Orchestra and the Main as well.
with the solutional. So that's all the strings of the main chamber. Then you have the foundation chamber gambas. Very bright, edgy string there. That's quite a, a thin sound. So then moving across to the other side of the auditorium, we have a pair of very bright strings in the solo. And you'll notice they're tuned in unison. Yeah, so on, a, we usually have two. It's a Celeste that's on one tab, but this is just right. to give it an extra little punch, I guess. Exactly. And the idea, again, is occurring here in the grate, not in the accompaniment, because the idea is that it's a part of the melodic line, keeping a very strong, tight unison. Okay. And then the most famous of the strings is the solo string itself. Mm. Now that's up in the orchestral chamber, so that actually goes down all the way to 16. It's a, it's a unique sound to be able to have that. That's not something you find in most church <laughs> organs. It's like a tuned bandsaw. It's really edgy, but it's, uh, I can see that being useful if, you're, if you want a melody to stick out, to be able to add that sort of growl and brightness to it. Yeah, so, but every chamber then has strings, and each one of those chambers, each one builds upon the other. The strings are a critical part of the ensemble. And the other part, of course, that we hadn't started talking about is the reeds. Every chamber also has a vox humana. That's really the place to start. That's maybe the most uh, distinctive part of the famous fox sound where, but it all coupled together. I don't, know, I don't know if it's coming across on our microphone, the stereophonic effect of having all those vox, it just swirls around your head I always you hear that sound. I tell people vox humanas are like uh, emulsifiers. They're like tofu. You know, you can <laughs> put them into an ensemble and get them to blend with anything. Yeah. <laughs> so then you can add the strings on top of those to even get a brighter, uh, edgier soup of sound. Exactly. That. Let's hear some of that. Let's, let's put those together. All just strings and vox humanas, which are available at four foot as well as eight. Right, in the accompaniment, they're available at eight and four. In the great, the voxes are available at 16, 16. and eight. Okay. Uh, and then they're not really available anywhere else except in the solo where you have a single tab that combines all four together. Oh, so you can just have automatically. Uh, the, the, the large box is available in the bombard. Okay. So again, it's the same idea of you know creating hierarchies of ensembles mm -hmm. within each keyboard. All right, then we have a, a number of reeds in this organ outside of the box. Um, color and power reads. Um, take us through. What you, what's your favorite one in here? <laughs> My favorite one? Well, probably uh, that's a tough question. The, probably the Mirabilis. The, in a Wurlitzer, all the stops are organized from left to right by their strength, mm -hmm. relative strength. And Wurlitzer viewed the Mirabilis as the strongest uh, stop in the organ. So you'll always find it at the very left mm -hmm. of all of the tabs. But That's very powerful, but it's also pretty smooth and, and mellow, really. It's not a piercing reed, uh, it's, but it's very full and, and obviously big, uh, big scale down at 16 there. That's um, for a tuba morabilis, it's, it's very English and warm. Exactly. There is a smaller scale counterpart, the tuba horn, which would uh, be in most Wurlitzer, smaller Wurlitzer organs. Very 
very similar, just a little softer. Right, and in the trumpet category, we have the same thing going on. We have a small trumpet and we have a large trumpet. Mm -hmm. And again, divided on either side of the auditorium, so you can right. either have a stereo effect or have one on opposite the other, depending on how you want to use them. Right, and the logic of the division is not accidental either. For everything on one side, you have its counterpart on mm -hmm. the other. You know, for every diapason, you have a tibia on the other side, mm -hmm. and each one is reinforcing itself in strength. Mm -hmm. There's a whole slew of important color reads. The 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 largest and perhaps most important because of its location, the foundation chamber, is the clarinet, which goes down to 16. It's an integral part of many ensembles. Very nice. French horn. Lovely. Oboe horn. So those uh, color reeds are, they're not real, they're not super loud solo sort of colors, even though in most church organs, your clarinet and your oboe are kind of going to stick out. Here, they're down as part of the accompaniment, right? Exactly. They're part of the orchestra. So, you know, really all of these soft color reeds are, in a way, they, all those reeds and the strings and the flutes and the accompaniment work together. The accompaniment manual and the pedal, you sort of think of as one. They are the orchestra. And everything else going on here, when you're learning to play a theater organ, the great which is really where the melody is, the bombard, which is where the brass would come in, or the solo, where you might have percussion, say. They're all the things that happen uh, outside of the orchestra. So you can mm. think of the theater organ like being an orchestra with a soloist singing a melodic line on top of it, and uh, the orchestra coming in occasionally and commenting on it. So there's a whole slew of color reads. In the solo, you'll hear an orchestral oboe. Usually works best with a flute, so I'm going to give you a little. Very similar sounding Kinera. No resonator, looks like Marvin Martian. Also sounds best with a tibia. The foundation has a musette. Same thing, needs a tibia. There's a crummet in the main. Also sounds really very well with the tibia. So a lot of these, a lot of these reeds you would just put together perhaps in an, in an ensemble, which would be, you know, something like. You might think of it as a Canera ensemble. Just adds that role. brightness to the edge, kind of like muted brass in a real orchestra. That's what it makes me think of. Yeah. But it's interesting think. because things like the, the crummet and the musette, we, we start seeing those, in it's, at least in America, in American organs, in the mid-century as solo stops <laughs> in neo-Baroque. And they were using the same thing here, but it was a completely different purpose. It was to color other stops and to give brightness um, and not trying to duplicate some 17th century creation. Right, but the reeds, the, the form of the reeds and the sound they're making is really based off of those 17th century right, models. That's where it came from. We just use it in a completely different way here. Right. This that's is what happened when they took them into the voicing room in England in you know, <laughs> 19, 1905 and Hope Jones started playing around with... In fact, there's a story about the Canera. The Canera was where he just had a reed block, was trying different resonators on it, and uh, at one point it was just the base of the, the reed mm -hmm. block, and that was the sound, and he heard that sound, and he said, I'm going to make a stop out of that, <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> There's a couple other reads we didn't hear. Speaking of bright, of course, the famous bright stop the, of the, you know, you're talking about brass. The brass section really is crowned by the English horn or the post horn. Bright trumpet goes down into 16. And there's also the saxophone. The saxophone is like a larger version of the Vox Humana. So if I were to turn the, the large Vox on and then the saxophone right after that, you'll hear the relationship. Um, 
It does sound it's, it's a lot like a Vox, just a little bit bigger, um, sound a little more punchier. Right, and this resonators are made out of brass. Okay. So without the trim, becomes just another innocuous color read. I don't think it really sounds like a saxophone. Was that actually what they were trying to duplicate? Was that usually it's a, a saxophone? I think of a smoother, um, still bright, but not not that reedy and edgy like that. If you think of the way that the saxophone works in an orchestra, mm -hmm. which again is the sort of mixing, you know, it's right in the middle of the woodwinds. That's what that's the effect that this has in the uh, in the ensemble. So if you had a, a you know a small. I'm going to put on just the tibia in the strings and then add the saxophone to it and you'll hear the effect that it has. It creates a totally unique sound, definitely. So it sort of fills out the ensemble like a bunch of woodwinds coming on. Well, again, it, it makes me think a big box yeah. with the strings and flutes. So it's the same bright color adding to that. Well, of course, this is where we take a departure from most traditional organ building. Uh, and we have lots of percussion in this organ. Lots of percussion. <laughs> Some organs have a little. This has got a lot of percussion sounds. So, uh, 13 tuned percussions. Wow. Let's more see. than any other organ, actually. This was the Fox Special was the one that was the, the king of the hill in that oh, department. Well, let's hear some of it. What do we got up there? All right. The Dinks and Clinks department. <laughs> uh, you know, you have, uh, again, in threes because it suggests how important they were. Uh, you have a xylophone. And automatically, this was set to reiterate. So there are three xylophones, the smallest, medium, and large. I'll demo those here. And then all together. They said they're automatically reiterating, so the fast repeating. Is that the only way we can use them? Uh, there's when you hold the when you hold the note, it will automatically reiterate. If so you if you if you just zap it, you get a single a single stroke. Okay. So it's just a matter of how long you hold the key. Exactly. What sort of sound you get? Up. All right, very good. Three xylophones. That's pretty fascinating. And then we have uh, the the chrysoglot, the two different metal bar harps. So this is like a glockenspiel, except it's a metal bar struck with a soft hammer. Mm. And then you have the harp itself, a wood bar harp. So really what this is is a marumba. You have a large and a small. And then of course a piano, which is also part of the percussion department. You'd use that in the accompaniment or possibly in a melody. It's available in, as an accompanimental instrument at 8 foot, but then you can actually have it at 16, 8, and 4 up as a more of a mellow, melodic line or even accompanimental if you want to play it there. So, yes. You know, that's great to have all those couplers. And there's a real piano up there in the chamber. It's, it's an it's, actual piano. Okay. Well, there's the glockenspiel. Okay. And it has a reiterating counterpart. So the, the bells re it here is the same stop, but the hammers are doing what the xylophone does. So here you actually get two tabs instead of right. the way you play it. Then you have a few other things up here. There's, there's two sets of chimes, small chimes, which are called the cathedral chimes. Come in. Okay. And those are in the diaphone chamber. Okay. The, the bigger chimes actually sound a little more mellow. Those are brighter and, yeah. and smaller, but the size of the, the, uh, the bell is itself, I assume. And that's in addition to all the other special effects. There's a whole junk drawer here with special effects, including bells and things that are for films. But these are just the tune percussions we're talking about right now. And that pretty much covers it, except for one very special one, which is the timpani in the pedal. Right. And so you're, those are in the pedal. It's just the bottom octave, or how it's, much? It's really just the bottom octave. I think there's about a dozen of them. Um, and it, it, they sound better, actually, when you have a pitch stop on with them. So if you put you know, a little bit of pitch with them, you have more of the effect of it. A, does, yeah. A drum roller. 
I think uh, it works better as a role than trying to play a melody on them or something yeah. to actually do. But, but it, yeah, it's really very. It's actually very useful for for sort of a dramatic pedal point. Wurlitzer only built seven sets of those, okay. so they're very rare. The Fox organs all had them, uh, <laughs> but but you know they're so unusual that they're, that you seldom ever hear them. Well, that's I, this, is, this is the first set I've ever heard, um, and I'm excited to go look at. <laughs> It's a whole complement of untuned percussions. They're available in every keyboard where you would use them. So to start with, in the, in the uh, accompaniment, you have the, the snare drums. Two, again, tambourine. Castanets followed that. There was also a Chinese block. Tom-tom. And a sand block, which is sort of like a tuned air leak. Now, some of our viewers know how you use these, and the idea is that when you have uh, a melody and an accompaniment, let's just put something very simple on here, if you add a percussion to that, it will automatically form a rhythm. So that's why there would be separate percussions in the pedal, separate percussions in the accompaniment. So when you, when you turn that on, every key on, the, on that manual... Right. Every time you hit a note, it activates the percussion. The, the pedal has a few that you didn't hear. There's a triangle. There's a Chinese gong. Uh, there's a snare drum, which you did hear, the jazz cymbal. Very far away, there's a bass drum. Uh, and that actually is also duplicated on the other side. Two bass drums. So you have a lot of different sound effects. And the idea, of course, is that you're, again, sort of doing this, this uh, uh, you know, for example, you can set up a very basic rhythm based on what keys you're pressing and where you've assigned different sound effects. We did not talk about the jingle bells. Uh, how could we forget the sleigh bells? They're uh, <laughs> in constant use in the Christmas season. How can you play jingle bells without tuned sleigh bells? Again, it works better with other stops on, yeah. so you'd have the, you know, the strings perhaps. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. I have seen those before, but it's, it's really nice to hear them in the room and hear them with, with the organ and how they're used. Well, one of the really distinctive things about the Theodore organ that sets it apart from more classical organs is the, the tremulance. The, everything is under a, a tremolo, and there are many of them, and they're usually deep and fast, too. <laughs> um, and, and it really makes a big difference. Things like the tibia, which are just a, a straight flute tone, really start to come to life and sing when, those, when yes. they've got that tremulant applied. So tell me about the, how many are there and how are they used? So there's 13 stop tabs here, but they control 17 trems. 17. Wow. And originally, not every stop in the organ was on tremulant. Yeah. So for example, the diaphonic diapason was, which is what goes down into the big diaphone, mm -hmm. that was just without trem. It was a flat, uh, flat trem. And also, the, uh, the, the, uh, what we now think of as the English post horn, the, the, po the post horn is oftentimes without trem. So you hear that now in an ensemble without tremulant. Um, so not every stop was automatically supposed to have a trem, and the trems for each one of those 17 wind systems, uh, it's uh, balanced for an ideal sound from the voices uh, you hear. You wouldn't be able to have a string, for example, on a tibia tremulant. The, the string would just clip mm -hmm. in and out of speech even, and that's really not the way that strings in an orchestra sound. So even within a division, you might, instead of having like the swell tremolo, you'd almost right. hear, here you have one for the tibia in that chamber or the box in that chamber, or because they're, they're separate, or even if... Right, every, in fact, every, you can see the four chambers laid out here. These are the four enclosed chambers, so you have the main, the solo, the foundation, and the orchestral, because of the, the chamber indicators. And you notice that each one of those chambers has this general chamber tremulant, so mm -hmm. these are the, the main, the foundation, the solo, and the orchestral. Everyone has a vox humana tremulant, and everyone that has a tibia, which would be the, the, the solo, the foundation, uh, and the orchestral, they all have separate tibia trem tabs, and that leaves us with the two tubas. Okay. So the mirabilis could be on or off trem, or its smaller counterpart could be on or off trem. So you have a lot of control over yes. the, the character of the ensemble with that. Absolutely. Well, and then looking below, we have a lot of, of shoes on this organ. We have a lot of chambers, <laughs> yes, a lot of shades to control. It's impressive. Um, what, tell me what each of these do, and how, how do they, what are they controlling? Okay, so each one of these corresponds to the swell shade indicators I should also, you have here. I want to point out, 
this is a really cool thing that the theater organs have that for some reason we don't see in a lot of church organs. We see, sometimes see some form of it, but it's an indicator just to tell you the position of the expression. Right. So as, as the shoe is open, you see the, the lever come down that tells me that the shoe is wide open. So you know where they are by just looking. Right. So there are seven chambers here. Uh, one of them has no enclosure at all. That's right. this 32-foot uh, diaphone along with the, the larger solo chimes. The other four we've already talked about. That's the main the mm -hmm. solo, the foundation, and the orchestral. Uh, there are two percussion chambers in addition to that that would normally have been enclosed. Uh, and you can control which one of those is on or off the general expression shoe based on the position so of these you switches. And have an all swells, we might call it on, a, on some organs, that controls all of the expressions. Exactly. You can actually tell it which ones you want. Exactly. So and so the order of the shoes then is exactly what you see here is orchestral, solo, foundation, main, and then you have a general, which is what most of most of the time you're on the general, perhaps, unless you start doing orchestral stuff, and you'll see my foot moving over to do that. And then raise to the right just a little bit, you have a crescendo, which does not have an indicator and has a cipher on it at the moment. <laughs> Something we know to play around before. All right, so yeah, just a, that's a blind crescendo, so you have yes. to, to hope that's working. And a few uh, spoons down there that I assume control maybe sound effects? Yeah, they're all part of the effects complement okay. here, so you have various thunder pedal. Differing, Those differing are all, all different types of thunder that we get out of that. Right? Yeah, basically <laughs> combinations of pipes <laughs> wired together. Then you have a snare drum. So these are first and second touch. And this is a Fort Sando, which is very interesting because in a Wurlitzer, this Fort Sando is momentary and it's first and second touch. First touch is full organ, second touch is full organ with the tuned percussions. It affects the grate and pedal only. So if I'm holding a chord, I have the piano on here, let's just hold a chord. So that's very useful because if you have an ensemble, exactly, you can get a little sting there, a subito forte. Well, you mentioned second touch. That's something that uh, we yes. see in organs and we really see it a lot on theater organs. So explain that to me and how do we use it with the stops? Well, second touch, for, for quite some time when I was learning theater organ, I, I was uh, taught the second touch is one of the things that makes, it certainly does make the theater organ unique, but it was not invented for the theater mm -hmm. organ. In fact, it comes from an even earlier tradition of organ building in France. It was invented by Victor Mastel in 1875. Uh, but it is perhaps the most important thing that a theater organ has going for it that allows you to expand your orchestral vision. So what second touch is, is a separate set of contacts under each of the keyboards that is equipped with it, or the yeah. pedal board. And if you if you register, let's say, something on the grade division as you normally would, I've just put on a tuba, you know, if you play into the second touch without anything registered, nothing happens. Uh, I'll do the same thing on the accompaniment now where I put on some strings and I'm going to register the same tuba on the second touch. So playing the same notes, but pushing through now. So I've engaged a second division. Now you say, well, why is that useful? Well, that's useful because if you have, uh, I've just coupled the pedal. If, if you have an accompaniment, and you can control your relative strength that your fingers are pressing, pressing, you can play in a melody and accompaniment all at the same time. So what this means is that you can have a melody and an accompaniment going all at the same time and have a counter melody on top of that. So let me put on a, one of our lovely tibias here. Or you can use that to double the melody uh, in the way that you would have, uh, I'm gonna put on a slightly louder tuba now so you can hear. Add some percussion to that. See. You can see how it starts to take off in the form of an entire orchestra. <laughs> because you're thinking, okay, I have the melody going over here, I have my accompaniment going over here, we need to have, you know, so this is the way that the orchestration begins to happen and becomes real fun, but you have to keep <laughs> track of all this going on here. Well, because, so you have your accompaniment stops over here, but then you have a accompaniment second touch, so you've got a separate right. set of stops, and those are the only ones that are available on second touch. Exactly. Uh, so, so the pedal second touch is all here, the accompaniment is here. 
uh, and it extends past this division here. Mm -hmm. So what you have here are the pitch, the organ pipes, and here you have the pitch percussions, mm -hmm. along with a couple of other goodies like the birds mm -hmm. uh, in the triangle, which suggests that those are useful, and then the black indicating a coupler of some form. Oh, so you can couple down another keyboard or uh, another sounds from another um, right. manual as your second touch. The great uh, at four foot, uh, the solo to accompaniment, or here you have a special situation which is really not second touch, it's pizzicato. Oh. And so the solo to accompaniment pizzicato, pizzicato is exactly what you think it is. I've just registered a handful, a handful of uh, flues up in the top uh, on the solo, mm -hmm. and I'm going to play a few innocuous strings in the So you push a second touch, you get the pits of your whatever was on the solo. It's actually on first touch. Oh, the pit. Oh, so it's when you push. It just happens to be organized in the second touch I division. See. And that's the reason for the extra I indicator. See, so, right okay. Here. Uh, and the second touch is available in the pedal, the accompaniment, and the grate. As well as the bombard. And the bombard up there. But you only have a couple of things you can use there, which are the. What are those? A horn 16 foot, 16 foot Mirabilis and the 16 foot. Post horn, okay. basically. We have one other little feature that's unique to the organ, and that's the sustenuto. Ah, sustenuto. Our magic trick, yes. <laughs> so if you have a chord, normally you take, take your fingers off the keyboard, the sound stops. With the sustenuto, of course, the sound continues, which allows you to go do all of the things, like register your pizzicato coupler and um, changing the chord because of the way it's constructed. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to disengage the sustenuto when I change the chord because of the way that it cancels itself once new notes are registered. So this is really ingenious. You can play incredible accompaniment. I can tell you a story I saw one time where somebody had it on for his last note and he turned on some more things and got up and let go and turned around to take a bow and uh, the organ was still playing because <laughs> <laughs> he forgot to turn it off. So uh, you have to remember that's on. An indicator light might be helpful. <laughs> but, um, and now we have the little secret drawer under here, which leads us to talk a little bit about, we have drawers on both sides, um, to talk about the purpose of this instrument. The original reason why they needed to have an organ in this room yes uh, that was first showing silent movies exactly this, this is this is a THX system for 1929 you know and the, the the amount of money that the theater would have spent in this day on this system is really proportional to what we would spend on a modern sound system for a movie house today uh, this was just the state-of-the-art technology at this time and what's so important about it is that there are so few of them really left in their original home mm -hmm. this is part of uh, it's, it's part of something which is much larger than just the history of the organ. I mean, this is uh, this is American culture itself here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the first 40 years, the voice of the first 40 years of motion pictures, this sound, this machine. I don't know how many of our viewers have had the opportunity to attend a silent movie with a live organist, but I mean, it's a silent movie. There's nothing. Everything is responsible. Every sound you hear is comes from the organist. And the, so you <laughs> needed all these sound effects so that you could give some life to the otherwise silent pictures on the screen. Right. And well, and a silent movie is really a misnomer because they, they were never silent. You know, right. there was always, uh, there was always a musical score. And overnight you had over 7,000 of these machines installed in American movie <laughs> houses. And so, uh, of course, there are going to be differing levels of quality. Uh, and that was one of the things that the, the motion picture industry sought to do was to, to standardize things and make a higher level of art. This was really viewed as serious art in its day. And so to have somebody just play music under a film that has little or nothing to do with the film does a real disservice to the film or to the art of film scoring. The way it was viewed originally was, was as serious art to accompany a film, to create the emotional effect, the pauses, the musical associations with the characters, uh, and to make sure at the same time that you're doing all of this that you, you hit the right sound effects at the right time. <laughs> so you have buttons and levers and switches, you know, hundreds of buttons here, including what we call junk drawers, which is everybody's favorite thing to show yeah, off on of a course. Let's look, uh, Tell me what we uh, got down here. We have an incomplete one on the right okay. side, uh, which has been cannibalized to help uh, keep other parts of the instrument going. But you have the idea. Uh, here you see that there's birds of various forms. There's a log whistle, a boat, a gong. These are all sound effects. Uh, auto, for example, uh, that you'd never find in a church organ. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to hear this. 
you know, right after the sermon. Uh, but if you had, uh, if you had, uh, you know, a motion picture with a car going off screen, or you had horses, you know, they're kind of far away and clattery here. But there are birds. Birds on either side. Different, different, uh, different whistles. You know, various sound effects, which if you're, if you're really creative with your timing and you know where they are, mm -hmm. can be spot on and have an incredible effect of Foley in the picture. There's also my favorite here. These are the surf effects. Okay. <laughs> it's a little hard for us to hear down here, but they're, they're, they're uh, essentially a, 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 a gated uh, Air gust, it's and so it sounds. It's, it sounds like yeah, it's a, it's a very large, elaborate tuned air leak. But, but it is effective. if there was water on the screen, yeah. you could probably be be fooled into thinking that was the sound and not realize <laughs> what you were actually hearing. The power of suggestion <laughs> is very strong. But these were these were really state of the art technology in their time, and this is what you're seeing here is really the evolution of three thousand years of history mm -hmm. of the of the organ adapted for this very specific purpose. You know, it was. It was gone in a flash, with the talking pictures coming in, and the depression, the economic motor, t you know, that was driving the construction of these disappeared. You know, America became interested in talking pictures suddenly, and so the theater organ was used at first, you know, perhaps as a backup, uh, because not only is this organ an amazing instrument for motion picture accompaniment, but you have to remember it's in an orchestra pit, and at the day that this theater opened, it was full of other musicians. They were all accompanying the stage show. The organ would be involved in the orchestra parts. There'd be doubling parts. They'd be an integral part of the operation here. And as the talking pictures came to the fore and the depression wore on, you know, the money to fund this type of entertainment diminished, and so the organists, if they were still employed, uh, resorted to playing before and after the pictures or for intermissions. They were trying to find another use for the instrument. And since the organ had always been a vehicle of pop music at that time, and uh, you know, if you, if you look back a hundred years ago, the organ culturally was in a very different place than we are now, the organs became very much uh, associated with popular music culture in their day. And people like Stan Can, who were so famous here in St. Louis, were, were, were celebrities. Uh, and, and rightfully so, because they, you know, they, they, they commanded uh, an important place in American music culture and, and our way of being entertained at that time. And it's thanks to them, really, that this instrument has come to the present day and has survived. I was going to say that we're very lucky to have this instrument in this room, yes. all of which have been restored to their original grandeur. The organ has been helped along by some very dedicated uh, volunteers, and Al Haker, who actually yes. works here at the Fox taking care of this instrument, uh, have been instrumental in keeping it. Yeah, we, Stan Can certainly brought attention to this room and keeping this organ uh, playing when he was here. And it, also the, the, the organization that restored this building, and in particular Mary Strauss, whose vision it was to really restore this place and not change it, and uh, over the years has been so supportive of this instrument and had such a clear vision of what it was originally used for. I mean, this is first and foremost a machine to accompany motion picture, and its preservation here allows that to be possible for the future.